Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to Real Talk, uh, Voicing the Margins. Uh, the title of today's talk is Food Fight, Discussing Food Insecurity and Its Solutions. Um, a little bit about Real Talk. Real Talk, Voicing the Margins is a series of curated live conversations on issues and topics of critical import to marginalized communities, including but not limited to people of color, LGBTQAI+, and economically disadvantaged citizens. Providing a voice and platform for often voiceless people is at the heart of this series. Real Talk Voicing the Margins is a partnership with the Woody Guthrie Center, the Tulsa Artist Fellowship, Folk Alliance International, Black Wall Street Times, and Tri-City Collective. During the pandemic, our Real Talk series is platformed on Facebook Live, and in time, we will return to live audiences at the Woody Guthrie Center. At this time, we would like to share Woody Guthrie's land acknowledgement. The Woody Guthrie Center acknowledges the land on which we gather is the home of the Osage, Cherokee, and Muskogee Creek Nations, as well as the ancestral home of the Caddo and numerous other tribes before the forced removal. Their honor and blood inform our spirit and our work. We also acknowledge the Black Americans who lost life, property, and generational wealth in the 1921 massacre. Their honor and blood inform our spirit and our work. Okay, I would like to introduce our three distinguished panelists today. Um, welcome in alphabetical order by first name, Bailey Perkins Wright, she, her, a native, a native of Lawton, Oklahoma, represents both the Regional Food Bank of Oklahoma and the Community Food Bank of Eastern Oklahoma as the State Advocacy and Public Policy Director. In her spare time, she teaches as an adjunct American Governance Professor for Oklahoma State University in Oklahoma City. Prior to joining the ranks of Oklahoma's food banks, uh, she worked for the U.S. House of Representatives, leading healthcare, education, nutrition, science, space, and technology policy initiatives for a congressional office in Washington, DC. The Advocacy Association listed Bailey among the top 21 advocacy practitioners nationwide in 2021. OKC Friday ranked her as the 11th most powerful young professional in Oklahoma City. And the Oklahoman featured her in its 21st century women series as a woman making, making significant contributions and driving change in Oklahoma City. Before Bailey's transition to Washington, D.C., she led the Oklahoma Policy Institute's legislative efforts. As outreach and legislative director, she represented OK Policy at the state capitol and strategized with advocacy groups to advance OK Policy's mission of broad-based prosperity. She graduated with honors from Oklahoma City University, earning a bachelor's degree in political science in history as a Clara Looper full tuition scholar and Petrie College of Arts and Sciences Outstanding Senior Woman of the Year. She earned a master of public administration degree from the University of Oklahoma. In 2021, Mayor David Holt appointed Bailey to the MAPS for Clara Looper Civil Rights Center Subcommittee. Bailey co-hosts the Let's Pod This political podcast and serves as a leadership Oklahoma Class 34 member, board secretary of the Potts Family Foundation, and board member of Leadership Oklahoma City. Welcome, Bailey. Next is Chris Bernard. Uh, Chris Bernard is a native Oklahoman who returned home in 2016 after 16 years of work and study in Austin and Chicago. Throughout his career, Chris has focused on changing systems policies and practices to impact issues of social justice and equity, including public health, 
criminal and juvenile justice reform, and hunger and poverty. He has extensive experience in policy, advocacy, legislative strategy, and program implementation. Chris has proven leadership in forging public-private partnerships and coalition building to solve complex problems. He has worked inside and outside the government to affect policy, program, and legislative changes that better serve citizens, save government resources, and produce better outcomes for individuals and communities. Chris's work has always focused on systems change, innovation, and scalability. He operates from a fundamental belief that to solve any problem at a systemic scale, it takes government and private partners leveraging their respective strengths and resources. As the founding executive director of Hunger Free Oklahoma, Chris has grown the organization from a staff of two to a staff of 33 in five years. He has built multiple public-private partnerships with state and local agencies that have increased the number of resources available to address hunger and the number of people who access these resources. He has launched three major emergency response initiatives to meet immediate need while coordinating for long-term sustainability and worked with stakeholders across the state to maximize the impact of federal nutrition program. He has also helped unprecedented collaborations amongst hunger stakeholders in Oklahoma. Through a focus on building public-private partnerships and fostering um, collaboration across the state, Hunger Free Oklahoma has worked with government and private partners to create and implement the largest SNAP outreach plan in Oklahoma history, creating a, state, creating a statewide childhood food security coalition expand the state develop nutrition incentive program by more than 2,000% in two years and facilitate a statewide outreach plan and rebranding of summer meals. Under Chris's leadership, Hunger Free Oklahoma received the 2021 award from the Oklahoma Center for Nonprofits in the transformational category and recognition as a mosaic 2021 top inclusive workplace. In 2021, Chris Bernard has was selected as the most admired nonprofit CEO in Oklahoma by the Journal Record. Chris holds a BA from the University of Texas at Austin and a JD from Northwestern University Pritzker School of Law. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. And last but certainly not least is Katie Flo Hockey, um, co-founder and executive director of RG Foods, is dedicated to creating equitable access to nutritious food through the development of local systems to enhance the nutritional and economic health of marginalized communities by overcoming barriers to healthy food access, including the development of mobile and micro grocery store models, local food hubs, and building the capacity of urban farmers. As a young single mom with three daughters, she struggled to put nutritious food on the table despite working two jobs. She is now dedicated to transferring economic power back to residents and creating a local food system rooted in justice. She is also an Ashoka Changemakers Fellow and Women Leaders for the World Fellow. Okay, um, so we're, we're discussing a food fight, um, insecurity, uh, food insecurity in, and its solutions. Um, and also we, we're gonna touch on food insufficiency as well. Um, so I'm going to read my little blurb here and then I'll, I'll hand the mic over to our distinguished panelists. According to the USDA, uh, United States Department of Agriculture, food at home store-bought grocery prices increased 3.5% in 2021 and is expected to increase more in 2022 this year. Um, a recent New York Times article attributes this to supply chain issues adverse weather, weather patterns, high energy prices, and various social, geopolitical, economic factors further intensified and destabilized by the ongoing pandemic. Added to this is the decades-long issue of low access areas to nutritious food, also known as food deserts. In short, hunger can affect anyone, even in the United States. According to Feeding America, more than 38 million people, including 12 million, 12 million children in the US are food insecure, 
And this is especially prevalent among families with children, communities of color, and rural communities. Um, okay, so I'd like to start with Chris. Um, why is this issue important and timely? I mean, so, so from my perspective, it's been timely for quite a long time, right? But it's important because it's, uh, so you, in my bio, which by the way, Katie should get points for having the briefest bio, but saying them up. <laughs> um, so I think I've worked in lots of other issues. I've worked on addiction and criminal juvenile justice. And what you'll see with folks who are involved in these deeper end systems is they have lots of risk factors when they were young and some are major, right? And food insecurity is a major risk factor um, across the board. It impacts your health, it impacts your academic outcomes, it impacts workforce, um, and it sort of creates a snowball effect. So I think those of us who've worked in the field have known food insecurity is an issue for a long time. I think the pandemic brought that to light for a lot of people who had never experienced it before or never really seen it, right? And now it was at the forefront. Um, and all of a sudden these programs that we've all been champions of, um, or in some cases have advocated to reform in some way, um, people were seeing in real action and we're starting to understand. So I think it it is more timely to the general public because they actually had to see it, like it was forced upon them. Um, and now with rising food costs, costs it's a, uh, it's like the next stage of the pandemic, right? First it was job loss and like immediate emergency crisis. And now it's, things are becoming more expensive and all these, um, I could go on about programs that were implemented during the pandemic, but they're all at risk of going away in the next four to five months. Mm -hmm. And they've increased um, people's buying power over the last two years. It's the reason food insecurity rates have stayed steady instead of going up during the pandemic. and. I think all of the folks on this panel, I know because I've talked to them about it before, we're all just wondering what happens when all those extra resources go away. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Bailey? Um, definitely echo everything that, that Chris said, especially because food insecurity is such an intersectional issue um, that I often tell people that food insecurity is rarely about food itself because there's so many external factors that contribute to why people are food insecure. And so even in the statistics that you mentioned in the beginning, Judy, um, about how supply chain and things that are happening um, economically around us are impacting um, grocery stores and other entities and their ability to receive products in grocery stores. Um, there's, um, you know, high um, demand on, on certain food items that makes the price go up, right? Um, and then that makes, for example, for SNAP recipients, that makes the value of um, the SNAP dollar go down, right? And so that gives people less capacity to be able to, to purchase um, the foods that they need to be able to uh, feed their families, fuel their minds to be able to show up in the workplace for kids to be able to focus in school. And so there's just a number of factors that I definitely agree with Chris that have existed well before the pandemic, um, but continue to exacerbate. Um, for our food banks, um, Regional Food Bank of Oklahoma and Community Food Bank of Eastern Oklahoma are Oklahoma's two largest uh, emergency food assistance providers. And during the pandemic, we saw a heightened need among our pantries of people who had never needed food assistance before, um, of folks who um, were on those margins of barely, you know, missing the, the qualifications of, of SNAP and other programs. And now with, you know, costs going up are, are in need of, of our, our services. And so uh, we saw about a 30% increase in need. Um, and we had a record distribution of foods out of our warehouses. Between the two organizations, we distributed nearly 100 million pounds of food to our more than 2,000 partners across all 77 counties. And so this is a real issue because um, if families, if children, if seniors, you know, everyone, like it's, it's, a, it's a core um, necessity for everyone to live and function. And if we don't address food insecurity, it affects um, 
all, all their issues around us, so. Thank you. Now you both mentioned uh, SNAP and for our audience, can someone explain what SNAP is exactly? Sure, uh, so SNAP is what um, has traditionally been referred to as food stamps. It stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, so your average SNAP benefit for an individual is around $120 per month in Oklahoma. Um, but during the pandemic, people have been getting what they call the maximum allotment. So um, closer to $200 a month per person. So when we see that drop um, for folks whose normal benefit might be $40 a month, you're gonna see um, bigger strains on exactly what Bailey was talking about, the partners of the food banks and other folks who provide the emergency assistance because all of a sudden their buying power drops. And one other thing I would love to add to what Chris is saying is um, as we go um, beyond the, the pandemic and as costs continue to go up, we also have to look at um, eligibility for SNAP um, because um, how it's calculated now, um, you have to be 130 percent over the federal poverty line in order to receive SNAP benefits. And there's so many um, Oklahomans and Americans in general um, who make just slightly above that amount and they are struggling to make ends meet, right? So as costs continue to rise, it especially hurts those who are right on that margin who don't qualify. And so we definitely need some uh, reevaluation on how we define poverty in this country. Thank you, Bailey. And Katie? Um... <clears throat> Yeah, um, I definitely, everything that's been talked about so far is so true. I just read an article yesterday in the Coalition on Human Needs, and they said the number of people reporting their households did not have enough to eat in the past, has actually, in the past seven days, rose from 21.1 million in December to 22.1 million in, from fe January to February. So that's like a million new people. You know, small changes in disposable income is difficult to manage and inflation is devastating to low income populations. Um, you know, and, and the, you mentioned that food costs going up three and a half percent is someone who purchases about thirty five thousand dollars worth of food for our, our stores each month. That is not even close to what it is. Um, I started doing some calculations. Apples have gone up 90%, chicken's gone up 60%, whole wheat bread went up 62%. So we're seeing, especially across protein and some of your staple goods, the prices are much higher and probably overall average more like 25%. So that is huge. And as they get ready to you know, remove some of the, the SNAP benefits, um, that's gonna be even more devastating. So um, we need to absolutely, um, talk to our legislators, you know, the farm bill is gonna be expiring, is gonna to need to be uh, redone. We need to really be paying attention to that and make the changes that we need now um, to look forward. Um, you know, supply chain um, is, is hard. Um, you know, this has gone on for a long time. It started way back in the 50s when we started seeing mega stores getting big, bigger, the wholesale distributors started getting bigger. Uh, minimum requirements for small stores are currently 25,000 a week. We saw a lot of our locally owned neighborhood stores go out of business. Um, and as the traditional supply chain has just gotten bigger and bigger, um, small store operators are not treated equitably as the large store chains. And they really um, you know, provide higher costs to those smaller stores because they don't have the buying power. Um, which is why it's difficult for these small locally owned stores to compete and to be sustainable. So there's a lot of changes that need to be broken. I think now is a perfect time because that that spotlight has been sh is being shown on that the broken supply system. And since other people who didn't realize it was broke, even though we all knew it was broke, now is a time where we're seeing a lot of funds, especially from the federal government, being able to be used to do real systematic change. So we need to take hold of this opportunity now and not wait. And Judy, if you don't mind, I would love to touch on something that, because Katie brings up an important point um, when it comes to um, the cost of food that also impacts 
um, our, our food banks and our partner pantry network as well. Um, because when it comes to the dollars that we're bringing in to be able to uh, purchase foods, it not only elevates the cost of that uh, for us to be able to, to purchase the foods that we distribute to, to families in need, but it also um, challenges the ability to get diverse products in the ways that we once were uh, prior to, to the pandemic. And so there are so many um, issues that are impacting those who are providing food, whether it's through the grocery store or even through our works as a food bank to distribute food um, that has to be addressed in order to um, ensure that we can feed families and do it in a way that's affordable. Yeah, absolutely. We've been running a, a COVID relief food program um, through the pandemic, and we, we put out about two and a half million pounds of food through our, our little warehouse. And um, yeah, I mean, I, we have to go out to the retail markets to purchase that food um, to, to, to give away. And as the prices increase, I just bought a thousand boxes of Raisin Bran earlier this week because my, my U.S. foods distributor said they accidentally got shipped 200 cases and they'd give me a really good deal if I could take it off their hands. And so it's like, yes, absolutely. Because, you know, anywhere I can save money that ensures my ability to increase the amount of food that each family gets. Um, thank you. And Katie, you mentioned the Farm Bill. Can someone explain to our audience what that is? Oh, I'll, I'll go first. I'm sure Bailey can fill in gaps for me. So the Farm Bill is where there are two main places that federal nutrition programs live. One is the Farm Bill and that's SNAP. And SNAP is your biggest anti-hunger program in the country and the most effective. Um, so anything having to do with SNAP having to do with ag, right? So farm subsidies, um, commodities, which are, are one of the ways that food banks get discounted product or donated product, that all lives in the farm bill. And it was designed that way to make it a bipartisan thing, right? Because rural supports ag, typically the urban reps are gonna be, talk more about poverty and food insecurity and those things. So way back in the day, it was created so that folks would support all of it, right? And in the end, SNAP dollars go back to farmers too, right? That all that money circulates. So every four years, you get a new farm bill, hopefully. That's not true every year, and it may not be true this year. Um, though it's actually 2023 when the farm bill hopefully will get voted on. Uh, debates will start now. And this is when you make policy is now. Um, and we have all these things advocates have called for um, that have happened over the course of this pandemic um, I'm sorry, the other place where a lot of things happen is child nutrition reauthorization, which is also, also happening right now, but hasn't actually been renewed for 15 It's more than 10 years. Yeah. Um, so it's just been status quo. But so that increase in SNAP we talked about, you could be looking at the farm bill and change the way they calculate um, or adjust SNAP every year based on living expenses. Um, there was a program called Pandemic EBT that lots of folks have gotten cards to help pay for school lunch. Um, that is a model that, especially in Oklahoma, the food banks and my organization have been calling for for summer. So calling it Summer EBT, Chickasaw Nation runs one as a pilot. It's great, but it's been piloted for 12 years. Three different farm bills have piloted that program. We know it works, we should scale it, right? So um, it is, Every four years, this big opportunity comes around to say, let's make changes. And every four years, nobody's quite happy with what happens, right? Which is a sign you had some good compromise or maybe some bad policy, one of the two. Um, so that's the farm bill in a very, very short time. Um, but it is, it, it determines how we fight hunger in the state because the less money that goes snap and the less effective you are, the more, these folks have to do, right? And the more people are relying on crisis and emergency um, response to help them survive day to day. And the, really the goal is let's make people sustainable and then they only have to come to these groups when it is true crisis. I'll say one last thing that I've talked too much, but we were talking about um, poverty rates and living wage and just getting by, right? So MIT has a calculator. I actually just found this um, thanks to uh, the United Way here in Tulsa. But M MIT has a calculator that tells you the living wage of where you live, where this is what it takes to live and not rely on any government assistance or charitable assistance. 
and Tulsa for a family of three, so two kids and one adult, it's $75,000 a year annual income, right? Um, Oklahoma City is close to the same. Um, in rural Oklahoma, it's lower, but it is always above what our median income is in Oklahoma, right? We have lots of folks who are living on the, like any one thing, a car repair, anything is gonna send them leaning on these services. And if we want to end food insecurity, you need sustainable programs and you need to fund it at scale to empower people to buy what they need to meet their basic needs. Well, a couple of things to add to what Chris said. Um, with the numbers out of that poverty calculator, the median income is about half that for most Oklahoma families. So not even just like single incomes, but like for families, right? And so a majority of Oklahomans are facing hard times, right? And I think that's something that um, our elected leaders and others who are, are making decisions in our state also have to to really consider the realities of where we are based on all of the factors that we've discussed um, since the start of our conversation. Um, related to the Farm Bill, one uh, powerful um, area of it that helps food banks be able to um, have the resources to distribute nutritious foods that are um, American grown commodities and fresh fruits and vegetables is the emergency food assistance program known as TFAP. Um, and as costs begin to rise, that means we also have to increase the value of um, TFAP to ensure that we're adequately um, compensating farmers and making sure that they're taken care of as their growing product and, and facing the supply challenge, supply chain challenges and other things that we've been discussing, but also to ensure that we're able to um, have the adequate value to be able to either be reimbursed for that product or be able to purchase that product and get it into the hands of families. So one big push right now um, that we're focused on with Feeding America is asking for $900 million. Um, additionally, through the TFAP program to ensure that we're able to keep pace with current cost and to ensure that um, farmers and um, agriculture is, is adequately taken care of as we're um, feeding families, so. Yeah, and I'd like to tack onto that too, as a farmer, uh, I have a farm in North Tulsa. Um, the, the farm bill is very heavy on commodity crops and there's, there's hardly any support for specialty crop providers, which is fruits and vegetables, which is what we should all be eating. Um, so I would love to see some legislative change in helping our small specialty crop farmers um, and because they're, they're struggling as well. It's really sad when we see uh, farmers that are also eligible for SNAP. Mm -hmm. Other comments and, and that that wealth of knowledge is why I'm just so excited about this, this panel. Um, so uh, some people might ask why why is there food insecurity in 2020? Um, oh man, there's all sorts of reasons for that. <laughs> uh, I mean, we poverty in I have gotten on a soapbox recently because you'll hear people talk about ending poverty. And it creates the wrong picture in people's heads, I think, that like, oh, that means everyone will have enough money just in the world to do whatever they need. And to me, we're working on system change. You end poverty by creating the programs we're talking about, right? So food insecurity exists because we have a free market system that some people make more money and some people make less. And that creates inequality, that creates inequity. And right now it's gotten worse during the pandemic, but it is always there. We're a service-based economy service jobs don't pay a lot. So we can either raise wages or we can create programs that subsidize incomes to help people afford food, housing, utilities, all those things. Um, and so we have not created a system that does either of those things well. And so we still have people who are food insecure, housing insecure, um, and living day to day trying to meet basic needs. Um, so you kind of, you got to have one or the other, right? And ideally you have a little bit of both probably because you also need emergency help. But we need to either invest in these programs that lift people up or we need to make sure everyone's making a living wage. And I think, you know, 
for me, I try and always say I'm neutral, but those are the solutions to the problem. So I'll talk about either one, right? But let's figure out how to get people the resources they need to live. Like, that's it. And a lot of what we're doing and what we're discussing is focused on basic necessities for people to live. We're mm -hmm. not even talking about um, people having disposable incomes to be able to go on vacations every once in a while or um, be able to see a movie or uh, other things that you know contribute to quality of life. Um, one thing I wanted to lift as well is related to that equity perspective. Um, we talked in the beginning about like the land acknowledgement. Um, we mentioned the Tulsa race massacre. And we have to remember that there's been um, a lot of intentional policy decisions over time, um, over the past hundreds of years in this country's existence um, that has intentionally put some people behind over others. And so as our problems continue to snowball, those problems continue just to exasperate. So you have a lot of disparities um, by race and gender in this country due to um, decisions that were made over time. And we still haven't um, grown past that because the wealth gap, um, the income gap continues uh, to widen in this country um, and especially for um, black and brown communities, right? And so I mentioned in the beginning that food security often um, has very little to do with food because we have a lot of food in this country, right? It often has to do people's ability to be able to access it. So we're talking about what Chris mentioned as far as people having the resources that they need to be able to um, buy um, food, but also if people um, have healthcare debt mm -hmm. and they're having to pay a lot of their money on prescriptions, that makes it difficult for, they, well, we put people in a place where they have to make impossible decisions. Do I buy fresh fruits and vegetables or do I pay for my prescription? Especially a lot of our seniors are facing that situation with fixed incomes that haven't kept pace with inflation, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing um, people who uh, may have had interactions with the criminal justice system and struggle to find employment opportunities that pay them adequate wages so they can get ahead, right? Um, so there's just so many different factors and layers that contribute to why, um, Americans are facing food insecurity, but especially Oklahomans are facing food insecurity due to um, policies that have been put in place, trauma that's happened over time. Um, but also, I mean, we haven't even got to the conversation about how um, accessibility is a challenge because Oklahoma is such a massive state in land mass. Um, someone made this map that I saw on um, Facebook this week that had a map of Oklahoma City alone and how there are six or seven different large major cities that fit within Oklahoma City's borders just by landmass alone, right? And so that's not um, a unique thing to even other areas of Oklahoma where some people may be miles away from the nearest grocery store and if there's a situation where a chain grocery store comes into a small town and then they decide two or three years to leave, then that community is left without resources, right? Um, so even the conversation related to um, access in food deserts is even such a complicated issue because sometimes it's about distance. Sometimes it's about um, systemic racism and where things are located, right? Um, North Tulsa just got a grocery store for the first time in uh, a couple of decades. Same thing with the Northeast side of Oklahoma City. It took 30 years to get a grocery store to be, that was full service, that had adequate, um, had a pharmacy in it that had fruits and vegetables to be on that side of town. So there's just a number of issues that all intersect at one time that create food insecurity in 2022. And then the things we mentioned in the beginning with the pandemic also just continue uh, to, to worsen the issue. But to Chris's point, we have to make intentional policy decisions and bold policy decisions in order to uh, move us in a direction that reduces food insecurity in this country. 
And I'll lift that, for example, um, some of the bold proposals in the Build Back Better Act, right, um, would help reduce food insecurity. We saw the impact that the child tax credits did for a number of families, right? Um, to have that extra resourcing, to be able to put their baby in um, childcare, be able to um, catch up on bills or, or whatever the need is for that family. It made a true difference. And it not only uh, made a difference for those families, but it reduced um, the need of food insecurity around that time. We, we saw uh, fewer people needing to come to our pantries when the federal government was invested in those interventions. And so doing those things in the long term and making consistent investments can help us chip away at a lot of these problems, but it takes those approaches to, to get there. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd like to take this just in a little bit different uh, uh, path. Um, we grow enough food in this country to feed every single person. No one should be hungry. There's $6 billion for the food that never leaves the farm annually, just doesn't. If we, if we save, and I'm talking about food waste, if we could save just 15% of the food waste, we could feed 25 million people. So we need to also address how our traditional supply chain works from the farm to the grocery store and, and, and stop that waste. Um, you know, it, I, and I heard someone on NPR and I can't remember his name. It was brilliant. I need to go after it, that he was talking almost globally that people don't eat because of, of capitalism. If you can't pay for your food, then you don't deserve that food. Mm -hmm. And that's where we need to, you know, the food's there, they're throwing it away because somebody's not paying for it. So, um, not only is, is that terrible for um, hunger in our country, but it is also bad for uh, climate change and our planet. So we need to be looking at, at the other side of the chain too. I, I'm sure you have another question, Judy, but I ahead, to Chris. jump in. I'm not a food waste expert, so I'm not gonna, I believe everything Katie tells me about food waste. That's my rule. Um, but I, to the point, Bailey's talking about, right? The reason you hear food advocates talk about SNAP or these other programs is they're not just about hunger, they're economic activity and they're uh, stimulators, right? So you spend dollars um, in, the, in your community in theory that creates jobs in your community and economic development. That's why it's so important to have grocery stores in every community. They are in rural Oklahoma, they are the tax base for municipalities. Like that's what pays for municipal government um, and that's why. And Chris, programs, just to interject on your point, yeah. for every dollar invested in SNAP and spent through SNAP, a dollar seventy is estimated um, generated in economic activity. So I mean, 100. it really is keeping grocery stores and um, the economy going in, in many local communities. Right, and and that's why those programs that are focused on like how do we give dollars back. Um, really work well, right? Because it's not just about addressing whatever need you're trying to address. It it stimulates an entire community. Um, it's why, you know, I can think back to, I was a, like a freshman or sophomore in college when the second President Bush did a big um, like tax rebate, basically. Everybody got a little more and it was an amazing thing and it was awesome and you're gonna spend that and it's gonna stimulate the economy but when we talk about it in the form of a child tax credit, somehow that's not the right way to do it, right? But that lifted more kids out of poverty than anything we'd done in forever. And it empowered families to buy, to spend on what they needed, whether it was childcare, car repairs, night classes, so they can start to earn more, all those things, right? And, and that's long-term thinking. And that's what scarcity actually changes your brain to not allow you to do, right? So if you don't have your basic needs met, you can't think about, the next step of like, how do I move into a better job or access workforce classes? How do I help my kid with their homework? Cause I'm probably going to my second job and I haven't eaten and I'm tired, right? Like it, if we could create systems that really just said, okay, your basic needs are met, figure out how to go from there, right? Like it's the, the cliche of like, you can't lift your up, yourself up by your bootstraps if you don't have boots. Like we need to give everybody boots and feed them so they have the strength to pull themselves up, right? Like that's all it is. Um, and I think that point gets lost. Like all, we, all you have to do is give people enough resources to survive and they're gonna thrive, right? 
but you're always going to have the need for those programs because there's always going to be folks who need to climb out. And there's always going to be something, right? And and I think that's the the thing with our, our food banks. We want to reduce chronic hunger. Um, there's going to be a natural disaster that happens. We live in Tornado Alley, right? <laughs> um, something happens to where a business has to close their doors and someone needs something in the gap. That is definitely what food assistance and emergency food assistance should be there for. In Oklahoma, according to USDA calculations, we have the fourth highest food insecurity rate in the nation, right? We have chronic hunger that exists in our state. And we have to do those investments and do the very things that Chris was just mentioning in order for people to get ahead in the way that um, we um, envision them to. Another piece that I wanna connect to what Chris said, um, when we're designing programs, in order for people to be able to get ahead, to have um, the bootstraps <laughs> to give it to them. Um, we also have to ensure that programs aren't designed in a way that put people in an impossible position. Mm -hmm. People are working hard to get ahead. Sometimes folks will um, get a um, promotion at their job that increases there, there's, there are salaries by like $2 an hour. But with that, we disincentivize it because then they have to potentially get less in their SNAP benefits or they get their child subsidy cut. You know, we hear those stories all the time. And I'm sure Judy, as um, a SNAP outreach professional, can attest to a number of the stories that we, we hear, we call it the cliff effect in the way that programs on the, are designed. So in addition to ensuring that more resources get into the hands of families, we also have to make sure that we're supporting families as they go all the way up so that we're not cutting their legs underneath them as they're working hard to get ahead. Mm -hmm. okay, I'm gonna do a plug for Katie to talk about something because I, so, there's that dollar seventy snap multiplier, right? Um, we we took on a program um, called Double Up, which is a nutrition incentive. So it makes SNAP worth twice as much towards fresh produce, and it tries to prioritize local produce. Um, you've heard a lot of reasons why that can be a struggle, uh, but the economic multiplier there, if you actually do local produce, is two seventy instead of one seventy, right? It's awesome, and. Um, it, if you can keep it in those communities, it's even better. So like Katie has her mobile store, but also is looking at these micro stores that I feel like that's the type of, like that's how local solutions and big nationwide scalable solutions come together, right? Like, so I would love for Katie to talk more about it because we're trying to figure out how we support it. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're gonna get to that, but go ahead. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Katie, tell us more about RNG grocers and what you've seen in your your work. Yeah, I'm really passionate um, about uh, not only nutrition but uh, but building and and reducing food deserts through economic benefits, and that's through local ownership. And so, uh, you know, going back, we've been working on this since 2008, and we're still here. Um, but we're making strides finally because it's the right time. I think we were a little too early to the, you know, to the station back in 2008. Um, but the economic impact of owning your own local stores is, is business ownership. You're keeping the flow of dough within the community. You're hiring the kids in your neighborhoods to work. Um, and, and that really starts to create generational wealth um, around social entrepreneurial uh, opportunities, which is what I'm very focused on. Um, and, and, there's so much opportunity along the whole entire supply chain. So not only having locally owned stores, but you know, increasing capacity of our urban farmers and our rural farmers, um, providing um, food hubs within the community so you don't have to go to those traditional um, folks that, that we won't go into why, why that's not good. Um, but there's just so many opportunities for economic development in local communities. And if you own your own supply chain and you have your jobs, that's where the pride in your community, you know, comes from. And it and it will overcome, um, you know, it it it's justice that you you have to you have to own your own your own systems so it can be what you want it to be and not what somebody else wants it to be for you. 
Um, so yeah, we've, we've been running a mobile grocery store for eight years. It's really just a Band-Aid. We take it to communities. We serve a lot of Tulsa Housing Authority um, and schools because you know there's just not a grocery store, but um, we're really excited. Uh, we're launching a grocery box program, which is upcycling shipping containers into full service grocery stores that can be put anywhere. And those are to be locally owned. We just want to be the distributor because that's the biggest barrier. So we have an accelerator program, a fresh food academy that we're launching, but not only will it be for residents, um, we have the funds to bring 20 students, high school students in so they can learn how to operate the grocery store at every level, how to be able to work in the food hub, to be able to work on the farm, to even work in the commercial kitchens because that's a whole nother economic stimulus, value added products um, to go into those stores. So I'm, I really want to just completely disassemble and shatter the current supply chain and rebuild it hyper-local. So that's, that's kind of my goal. <laughs> and Katie, what I love about that too, is that not only are you um, keeping the community alive from the sense of making sure that people have fresh fruits and vegetables um, to be able to eat in fresh foods, but also keeping the community alive from being able to hire the kids and, and the, the families in those areas so that they stay. I think one fear in Oklahoma for a lot of rural areas is that their children go away and they move to larger cities or they move out of state for opportunity because jobs are scarce in those communities. And so um, even beyond food, it, it literally keeps communities alive. Yeah, the grocery store is really the corner store cornerstone of any any community so you know that's that's and 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 what I like about the grocery box too we're actually looking and working with some real communities um, where we can actually put the grocery stores in those communities and they'd be locally owned and as we're working on our local food hubs we're working with other regions Muskogee and Oklahoma City where we can connect our food hubs and so we can backhaul almost in a circle and we can make our routes so they go through these rural communities um, and then, you know, be able to distribute because we do grow such different things in different parts of Oklahoma. So it's really not just, you know, lo just local, local, but it's, it's, it's helping the whole state. 33 uh, uh, counties in, in Oklahoma are considered complete food deserts. There's not a grocery store in the entire county. Um, and that, that's ridiculous. <laughs> but that's that kind of macro micro meeting together to me, right? Like I, this is my job to talk about SNAP and how awesome it is and how amazing it is. And it is, and it benefits individuals. It only benefits communities if the communities have the store there or the infrastructure for those dollars to come in. So in Tulsa, Bailey talked about Oasis Grocery Store opened on the north side. Um, before that, right, one of the busiest bus tracks in Tulsa was from the north side all the way out to 81st and Lewis mm -hmm. uh, to a Walmart. So all the dollars of the north side got spent over on the south side and then went to a big box company. So they, they stayed local in the sense they paid for jobs, but not as much stayed local, right? Um, so you need the local solutions that can leverage the massive resources that the federal or state government has to put into those communities. Um, so it takes a little bit of everything. So as a state or a city, we should be thinking about, um, you know, there's, I was just talking to somebody from Chamber of Commerce. There's they have now opened up this leveraging fund where if a local community starts a TIF uh, tax increment increment financing, so it's, I'm not a tax person, but sales tax gets collected to go towards a social good in that community, the state will match it towards a grocery store or a mixed use building, right? If it's in a traditional food desert, like there's opportunities there and I think we need to get better at leveraging them, but we also need to be advocating for those local solutions that better leverage the federal dollars, which Oklahoma traditionally has been terrible at doing. We, we are a donor state. We pay more in taxes than we bring back. Yeah, and the whole and, and the whole other economic side of that is when you don't have grocery stores in your neighborhoods and you're relying on the convenience store, which is don't eat there, it's gonna kill you. Um, <clears throat> I just lost my thought. Ah, oh no, you know, nutrition, you know, access to healthy fruits and vegetables. We spent $777 million in Oklahoma on diet related diseases that does not need to be there. It, what, imagine if we could save $770 million a year yeah. where, where we could put it in our education system. So 
you know, making sure that there's fresh fruits and vegetables and real food in every single neighborhood has an economic impact for the whole entire state. Yeah. There's a, I mean, our obesity rates, heart disease rates, all those things, right? Yeah. And double up, I'll just plug our program because we are seeking state money for double up too. Um, and we'd actually like to see it be systemic and be on EBT with SNAP. But in our stores, we're in nine grocery stores because that's what we can afford to do right now. That's about $2.4 million in benefits paying for fresh produce a year. Um, produce, SNAP produce sales in our stores go up as much as 430%, on average 270%. And we've talked to folks and what it is, like when your resources are limited, fresh produce is a risky product, right? Because it goes bad and it takes, it doesn't take time to prepare everything. I know you can eat things raw, I don't like raw vegetables. I know lots of other people don't, right? And it takes time to cook. Mm -hmm. um, so that when you create this, this incentive that says, no, it's only good for fresh produce. I mean, people leverage it and they are, it's not just like they're buying potatoes, right? We're seeing stone fruits, like leafy greens, like kale and stuff. Like that's what they invest in. And they learn, you know, they try new stuff. The grocery stores we're in are moving apples to where candy used to be they are expanding the footprint of their produce section um they're getting more variety which impacts the whole community not just folks on snap right because now they have more access um and i think the more we can think about program we always like to talk about limiting uh what you know people who access this benefit shouldn't be able to do this or shouldn't be able to do that the irony of that is one it creates a ton of bureaucracy which makes programs less efficient but also, like, let's talk about incentivizing. When you hear us talk about businesses, no one says, well, businesses we give money to shouldn't be allowed to do that. We say we want to incentivize businesses to do this. That's the same way we should think about people, right? Um, give them access to more capital and they're going to make better decisions because they know what the better decisions are. It's just hard. Sorry. Yeah, we, we, we see, um, you know, about 60, 61% of our sales are SNAP. Um, and we, we gave out, I think we gave out about $80,000 with the uh, free fruits and vegetables um, through Duo last year. Um, but we also see, it's, it's interesting, um, everybody becomes a vegetarian at the end of the month because as they, they, save their, they save their double up coupons and as they run out of their SNAP benefits. It's like they're coming through with nothing but fruits and vegetables, which I love because now I know they're they're getting more nutrition. But as they access that and eat more, I think our bodies start to crave that because we see people just we see a pattern of them buying more fruits and vegetables without their double up bucks mm -hmm. as well. So um, just, you know, if you have to have access to change your eating habits, if you don't have access, then you, you don't have it. You know, we used to do all these cooking demos and classes several years back when they were that big hot thing. And it's like, how undignified is that? Because you're teaching them all this information, but they have no access to this food. It's almost cruel. Um, so, you know, access in every neighborhood that should be the norm. And access well, and, physical and financial. Yes. Physical Absolutely. and financial. Because one other piece I was thinking related to SNAP is um, our um, leaders in, in Washington, D.C. have the ability to make changes and adjustments to the SNAP program through the Farm Bill, right, um, to make it easier for people to be able to access foods. One thing that's become a new phenomenon um, and I would say prior to the pandemic, um, but more grocery stores are offering like hot bars and um, salad bars to be able to prepare foods. One of the barriers that's been created as a restriction to SNAP is that people can't buy hot foods. So mm -hmm. I think about uh, my upbringing, um, I lived in a single parent household growing up. And we were busy all the time moving and going. And so I can only imagine um, other families um, that may have uh, even fewer resourcing than my family did having to, you know, it'd be easier if you could buy um, the, the meal that has the, the spinach and the fish and the broccoli already prepared for you to be able to eat at that time. And we've created a barrier for families to be able to do that or to buy that rotisserie chicken from the grocery store that they would eventually just throw away, right? And so um, I hope that 
um, there's advocacy even on that front um, to ensure that more families have the ability to make um, healthy eating an easier choice, even by uh, the opportunities to, to be able to purchase hot foods with their SNAP mm -hmm. benefits. Yeah, we get around that because we do our own prepared foods in our commercial kitchen. We just put it in the refrigerator and make sure it's cold when they buy it. There you go. Even the rotisserie chickens. <laughs> That's the key. But it is the farm bill is the key. I mean, to Bailey's point. So we've talked a lot about what to buy with. And like my double up program is half federal dollars and that's in the farm bill too. And, but we have to raise the private side. We'd like to see that match bigger, like a three to one federal to private dollar. And we should be thinking about that all the time. Like right now, often in these programs, um, it benefits states that have different tax structures and more money, right? So um, states that we don't tax a lot, we don't have a ton of available state resources to match these programs, it's harder for us to access them. We have to rely on private capital. There's only so much of that. Um, so thinking about how to, to change those matches, um, but also child nutrition reauthorization, though it's not a way, it could be a way you're buying with PEBT, but that's a huge piece too, right? So you talked about families, households with kids are way more likely to be food insecure. Women, and particularly women of color, way more likely to be food insecure. And you add kids to that mix and it gets worse, right? So I mean, oh, more than half of SNAP recipients are households with yeah. children. Yeah. And so the, the child nutrition programs, which the food banks run, um, but that's also school summer meals, after school meals, school lunch, school breakfast are also key to this whole piece, right? Because that's when your SNAP benefits run out in the summer, like you're going to go find those child nutrition sites for your kid to get breakfast and lunch. Um, but we've created so many barriers around that even like your kid has to sit there in normal times, not right now because we have waivers because of the pandemic, your child has to sit there and eat. Um, so if your kid wants two meals a day from one of these sites, because they can only serve two, not three for some strange reason, um, they have to go there twice, right? Instead of making it easy, especially in, imagine rural Oklahoma, you live 20 miles from your school and you're gonna drive there twice to get two meals a day. Like economically, you spent more in gas than, you know, so like just thinking common sense wise and starting to remove some of those barriers and make it easy, easier to get the food to the folks who need it or for them to access it once instead of three times a day if they want to eat a meal. All of those things that sound common sense and we'd have no problem with if we were just talking about like, you know, I'm going to buy breakfast and lunch at the same time because I live 40 miles away. Um, that makes sense to a lot of people. But when you say folks who have way less resources than you, they should have to go there and eat twice, right? Like it's it's all knee jerk to miss we've told ourselves about people in poverty. Um, well, and Chris, that's another factor of why Oklahoma ranks lowest in participation yeah. in summer mills programs anyway, because mm -hmm. of all of these structural barriers that, that are put in place that make it hard for for families to, to use that the resourcing that they need. And we saw such an increase in participation and being able to feed kids because of the waivers that have been put in place from the pandemic. So hopefully we can also, another advocacy plug for the listeners, um, talking to our congressional delegation to say a lot of these waivers need to become permanent so that we can continue being able to feed kids. So as yeah. we wrap up our, go ahead, Katie. No, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. So as we uh, wrap up our conversation, we, we have discussed, well, a lot, haven't we, about food insecurity and, um, and ways to combat that during this hour. Um, what, what can we give our viewers as far as, um, you know, like what can they do to help this, this issue? Um, like I think about the increase in like a food autonomy movement, right? More community gardens and funding for that and co-ops um, coming together uh, to, to build these and um, more um, interactions in our food banks and food pantries. Um, so what, are, what can our viewers do um, to combat food insecurity? So I would say there's a number of things, right? On the individual giving level, um, you know, giving donations or doing food and fund drives 
um, help ensure that food banks are able to distribute food um, across the state to all 77 counties. And so that's our volunteering in the volunteer center or volunteering at your local pantries. Another physical thing you can do if you feel like, you know, my coins are strapped right now. I don't have a lot of money. You can definitely give your time to, to serving um, because that also um, saves money for our, our pantry network to be able to then use those dollars to then uh, feed more families. Um, I would say on a policy front, if you wanted to advocate, I will let Chris talk about advocating for duos. I won't steal his thunder on that end, um, but there are opportunities for um, the state and federal government to make investments um, to address food insecurity, right? There are proposals um, right now, o Oklahoma has received $1.8 billion in American Rescue Plan Act funds, right? Um, it's important that our legislature prioritize um, investing in food and food systems um, to be able to reduce food insecurity in our state. Um, food banks are, are running legislation that would help make investments to tackle hunger on college campuses. And so pushing our legislature to make those investments. At the state level, we just talked about a number of, of investments that need to be made through the farm bill, um, as well as through um, child nutrition reauthorization, but more importantly, through the Build Back Better. And right now it's caught up and installed. So they need that political pressure of, of moving those bills forward so we can make those transformative investments in our people to reduce food insecurity. So I'd say talk to your federal delegation and uh, senators and representatives about the needs to invest in food security programs and same thing at the state level. Katie, you wanna go? I'll, I'll just fill in. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with absolutely everything she says. We need to get involved. If you have the ability to go to the Capitol on some of the Capitol days, to, to talk with them, um, your representatives in person, that's even better. Um, and then just on an individual let, you know, level, the simplest thing you can do is grow a garden, grow in your backyard, um, grow on your patio of your apartment. Um, if you grow your own food, that is the first step to food security. So um, get engaged. If you don't know how to grow food, there are a lot of programs out there that, will, that, you can, that are free that you can um, go to and learn. Um, and or if, if, if you have, if you are privileged enough to not be food insecure, grow a garden and donate to the food bank or donate to other folks that are, um, are getting food to people in need. And before Chris wraps us up, because Katie mentioned going to the Capitol on Capitol Day, yeah. talking to lawmakers. We have Anti-Hunger Day at the Capitol on March 29th. I won't physically be at the Capitol, be virtual, but we'll give you opportunities to talk directly with state lawmakers. And so March 29th from one to two. I was going to plug that, Bailey. I had that. <laughs> oh, thanks. See, thank you. <laughs> um, so agree with everything that they say. Here's what I will say. I think we do ourselves a disservice often by um, thinking only in one way, right? So 94% of the total food safety net is federal dollars. So like you have to, you can donate and you should, and you should do local community work, but without the other piece, like you, you don't have the whole solution. So you can call your representatives, call your delegation, but a secret of the nonprofit world is most private foundations don't like to pay for advocacy. There's lots of legal rules around it, lots of things. Private donors who don't restrict their funds are crucial for nonprofits to be able to advocate, right? So that's who pays for like my job and Bailey's job and we get to do good things um, and really be at the table when policy is being made. So um, also look at donating in those spaces, right? Because you can direct your gift and even say you want it to go to policy and advocacy. Um, I also think just be ambassadors. Like there's way too much stigma around these programs and people who badmouth them or people who don't understand them, right? So we were actually talking to decision makers. I'm not gonna out anybody about a bill that um, was talking about the child nutrition programs. And it turned out talking to these decision makers, they didn't realize that the USDA paid for the summer meals that like the YMCA's and Bro Boys and Girls Clubs put out, right? They thought that was all private money. 
And that changes your, your worldview of what's needed for a solution. So just being able to say like, no, these programs are awesome. And guess what? They simulate the local economy and they're helping kids get the nutrition they need and changing the narrative is a big deal because that's what decision makers hear. When the narrative changes and public opinion changes, then politicians vote for stuff. Yeah, you the I think that's a, a good place for us to end. And um, I will post, um, I will gather a list of resources <laughs> for myself and our panelists and we post that later for our audience. And um, I just want to thank um, Bailey, Chris, Katie, and our, our live audience um, for joining us for this important uh, discussion. Um, and uh, and I need to give a quick uh, thanks and appreciation uh, to the folks that made uh, Make Real Talk possible, Tri-City Collective, the Woody Guthrie Center, and Chris, I see your- That's right. Yeah, <laughs> I saw that. Um, Folk Alliance International, Tulsa, Tulsa Artist Fellowship, and the Black Wall Street Times. And again, thank you to all that joined us live today. Join us again next month um, for another Real Talk. Real Talk is live every third Saturday. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye.